thank you for uh, taking uh, this, uh, you know, uh, time this evening uh, to come and um, uh, uh, share uh, uh, this, uh, this this very important topic, right, of leadership. It's so, and and uh, as uh, Ding Yuan mentioned just now, re really, we are all excited to have uh, CEOs back again in China and at CIBS uh, to share your. Uh, uh, your, your wealth of experience and knowledge, uh, you know, with our students, alumni, and uh, really anybody who is interested to expand their knowledge, right, in this particular area. Uh, so, um, so, so I was asked to basically interview you, Andre, right? Uh, and uh, so I was trying to figure out what is the most difficult questions I can come up with. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but uh, I have to say, I have to admit, I have not read the full book. Yeah, uh, but what I thought was interesting is that you can take any chapter, you can start with any chapter, uh, and, and you basically don't miss much of the previous one. So I felt that they are all standalone chapters. Uh, and so if there is anything that you are interested in, in particular, you can just pick up that chapter and read that chapter. And I think there's quite a bit that, uh, you know, Andre, uh, writes about uh, as far as that area is concerned. So, of course, I picked up those things that was attractive to me, uh, and and I I'm hoping that uh, you know we'll be able to have some deeper uh, conversations uh, together, right? Uh, so, I, I'm going to kind of start the questions going, uh, and then uh, if um, uh, uh, somewhere in between, I would also reach out to you to see whether there are any particular questions that you would like to ask. Uh, you know, about this topic of uh, leadership with so, Because really, uh, I think those of you who are from SIPS, you know that uh, uh, the school's mission is basically to, to, to educate, to nurture responsible leaders, right? That is the key mission of the school. And I think that's the reason why books like this are so much in our, our path, right? Because it is talking about uh, being responsible leaders, right? Because I, I, I al I've always said that being a leader is easy, but being a responsible leader, that's where the challenge is going to be, right? Uh, so, so without, without uh, wasting too much time, uh, uh, let's uh, start this conversation, Andre. Uh, I actually Googled your last name to figure out how do you say it. Uh, so so I was, it, the Google basically said it's La Croix. La Croix, yeah. right? Okay, all right. But Andre is good enough, right? Cool. Yeah, okay. All right, so Andre, what, what I wanted to do first is, you know, I, I, want to, I want to know you as a person first, right? Uh, so if you can spend a little bit of time telling us about yourself, right? What, what motivates you? What makes you tick? What makes you get up in the middle of the night? What do you worry about? Right, uh, uh, you know, because I, I, I've, I've always thought that, you know, you talk about an organization, the CEO is the key, especially when we talk about CSR, ESG, right? My research basically shows that it depends who the, the CEO is. If the CEO really believes in ESG, then you find that the company is also very active in social responsibility, right? So I think that's the reason why I want to know you first, right? So. Who are you, Andre? Okay. <laughs> That's very interesting. Uh, we, we just um, uh, accepted a new board member uh, at Intertech, uh, Kawal. She's from uh, Hong Kong. Uh, she's running Federal Express here in the, in the region. And we interviewed her over, over teams, et cetera, and so forth. And I met her for the first time for dinner. And, and uh, we didn't have time to finish the conversation. But she said, what's your story? So um, same question. Uh, Look, the, I'm a very, very um, simple character when you understand the ingredients, uh, the keys, the ingredients. Um, when I was a kid, right, I wanted to be a surgeon because I thought that, you know, saving people's life was the grandest thing you could do, right? Um, and, and overnight, uh, just before making the big decision what type of university or school I would choose, I changed my mind overnight because I went to meet people who were in real life. And I was fascinated by uh, a young CEO uh, in, in the south of France who basically opened my mind on what being a leader was. Obviously, there were very few books on leadership at the time, but 
there was a people dynamic uh, you know, content that really attracted me. And then there is another side to me, I'm very impatient. Uh, and, and to be a surgeon in France at the time, you had to study for about 15 years, and I was not really in that uh, space. So, uh, but equally, equally, and, and I get the question a lot, right? What drives me? I've done a lot of sports and very, very competitive, but when I was a kid, I knew somewhere deep down that I was here to make a difference. I didn't want to be just another person, you know, passing by on the planet. So impatient, humanist at heart, um, here to make a different a difference, uh, very uh, competitive. I hate to lose. Uh, so I've done, you know, competition in sport in many, many disciplines. And, and, and where do I get my energy today um, is essentially uh, seeing people grow and excel. And my colleagues who are, you know, uh, here with me tonight, you know, might not totally relate to that, but because I'm a humanist at heart and I believe in doing big things, uh, you know, for the greater good of society, what really drives my energy is, of course, the progress we make, but is seeing people excel and go beyond their own limits because that's what progress is all about. Human beings are going to be better human beings at the end, right? So that's who I am, quite simple. You say you are competitive, yet a humanist, right? In by nature, I'm wondering whether this is actually opposite, because when you're competitive, you want to win, but when you're a humanist, you want others to win, right? So how do you how do you square these two things together? I think you know being a humanist is you know putting people at the forefront of everything we do in the society, right? And um, I mean, you can be uh, highly competitive and humanist. You know, there is a code of ethic that you need to respect. Uh, and there is nothing wrong about being the best. At the end of the day, isn't it what drives us all to try to be ever better every single day? And when you look at sports, when you are uh, competitive in a team, it's all about doing it with your colleagues and in a company, it's uh, you know all about teamwork, right? So I think this is this is uh, you know uh, totally uh, simple to explain. Okay, all right. So so let's let's go to the book, Andre. Right? Uh, maybe you can start by giving us an idea of uh, you know an an overall view yeah. uh, you know of the book. Uh, there are ten uh, you know ten uh, let's say uh, uh, leadership principles that uh, you know that you have listed out. Uh, maybe that could be a basis for some of the questions that uh, you know that the audience would want to ask you as well. So the let me just explain first how. Uh, was the idea of the book born? Um, because it's important to understand, you know, why I, I wrote the book. W when I was in my early years, um, you know, working for Colgate and, and, and Pepsi and Burger King, of course, I read lots of management books. I read all the best books that you can, can get. And at one point of time, I became a leader myself. And I'm not being arrogant, but I was never satisfied intellectually by the content of all these books that I read because I didn't feel there was an end-to-end, -end, you know, systemic model there that you know would help you to become you took a responsible leader. I talk about a good leader, right? We're here for the greater good of society. And so I had this this habit of you know working on my own leadership style and taking notes. Right uh, on what I found, you know, useful or not working, and how I could improve myself, etc., and so forth. That's what I was doing on, you know, every single day in, in the action. And then at the time, I was running Burger King in Germany, and there was a very, um, you know, important journalist in, in the trade press called Gretel Weiss. She had interviewed us at Burger King many, many, many times, and we did a perfect turnaround. I talk quite a bit about it in the, in the book, and then. It must have been the fifth or sixth interview. She was preparing a story on us, and, and she was basically going to give us the big prize. 
And she said, Andre, you know, I, I've never asked you this question, right? What do you want to do when you were a kid? I said, I wanted to be a surgeon. And she said, that's it. And it was a, a light bulb moment because she said, you know what? That's it because people know that you care. You drive the organization hard, but first and foremost, you care for the people in the organization to excel, to progress, and, and take the company forward. And then after you know, she published the article, I got asked to talk about my own leadership style. And I had never thought about it beyond writing notes on how to get better every single day. And I said to this consulting firm, um, you know, okay, why not? But then I had to, <laughs> to think about what is it I was doing differently. And I said, okay, I'm going to immerse myself. It was a flight between uh, Sydney and, and, and Singapore. And with a glass of champagne in the, in the plane, it came naturally. Uh, the, the 10 principles that are basically um, the base of the leadership with soul model came naturally then. Obviously, I presented uh, the model and it was very received. And I started practicing it, practicing it. And, and eventually, I wanted to write a book and I wrote the first manuscript, the second manuscript. As you heard, uh, we basically give a course internally. And essentially, you know, um, because I believe there is no end-to-end -end model that suits me, that is about good leadership, I thought that writing the book would help people who are willing to stop and learn on how to become a good leader. So essentially, the idea of the book is an invitation for people who want to learn. It's not a funny book that, or, or it's a light book. It's quite serious, right? Every chapter has got you know, theoretical content, examples, but it's an invitation for people to stop and learn about their own leadership style. Not saying that everybody needs to follow the 10 principles, but these work for me and might work for you or might help you think of a different model, right? That's simply about helping people to think what good leadership is all about. You don't have to answer this question. Um, I, I, I find that uh, you are not the first CEO to write a book on leadership, right? There are many other CEOs. Uh, I remember, I think, uh, uh, last year or the year before, uh, uh, I, I did an interview with another uh, uh, CEO who also wrote a book, right? And that was the heart of business, right? So I was wondering, why do you guys end up writing a book? Is it a, a, a legacy that you want to leave behind? Uh, you know, is it, is it something tangible that you're able to say that it's me? It's not, it's not about the ego or, or me. It, it's simply reaching out to help out. Um, I mean, being a leader is super tough. Being a good leader is really, really hard work. And it is my view and not being, you know, uh, negative about all business schools around the world. I don't think there is a program out there that is truly end to end that has been, you know, proven by you know someone practicing it every single day, delivering results. That's got the balance that is in in the, in, in the model that is certainly very contemporary in its uh, in, in its aspects because everybody talks about sustainability, but unless you put people at the heart of your growth strategy, you cannot drive sustainable results no matter what you say, right? So for me, it's simply there because I believe that the world needs good leadership. And I'm, I, all the examples in the book are real examples, examples that I lived firsthand. I only use one external piece of data, which is Gallup. And, and you know that Gallup is the authority when it comes to engagement. And the data is shocking. 80%, 80% of the global workforce is disengaged, which means that every single day, 2.8 billion employees go to the workplace and go through the floor, but not really satisfied, passionate, truly, truly energized about the day ahead. And this is a huge opportunity that is out there for any leader. And to me, an organization that doesn't have an engaged workforce doesn't unleash its full potential. So really, it's, it's to help, it's to help leaders think it through. You, you, you mention about this quite a bit in the book, right? This, this engagement of people. Yeah. But what do you mean by engaging people, right? Uh, uh, I, I guess you're talking about being people-centric, right? But how does this actually happen? 
right? How are people engaged in their work? Uh, uh, you know, and how does the leader try to motivate people so that they look at their work as a, you know, a passion, a calling? How, how do you do that? So, I mean, that's what the 10 principles are all about. And, 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 and as you know, there are principles that are about the what, what you're supposed to do, you know, when you lead a company and how you do it. And, and, and the balance is really how you get this, you know, high energy engagement level. Defining engagement is not that complicated. It's about making sure that people truly understand the meaning of what they're supposed to do in the office, right? That's why, you know, it starts by being purpose-led. As a company, if you are purpose-led, then you're more likely to have an engaged workforce. People will understand the difference they are here to make in society or in, in their market. Another uh, important uh, part of engagement is making sure that, you know, you really put people at the heart of your growth strategy and day-to-day -day action. So I give the example at Disneyland Paris, when I arrived, we are bankrupt, right? Uh, I had to negotiate with the banks. I was, you know, with the French media all the time talking about we might close. And I had to motivate, you know, 12,000 cast members who are there to make families happy every single day. And basically I said to them, look, we're going to do that together, right? They contributed to the genesis of the diagnosis, the strategy, the implementation. It's about, of course, communication. It's about, of course, reward. It's about recognition. It's about respect. It's about making sure that people get, you know, the right uh, personal growth opportunities. But it's also being truly honest. I mean, there are, you know, leaders out there that have a tough time to give bad news. There are leaders who confuse being respected and being loved. It's not about being loved. It's about being respected. If you cannot explain a tough decision to your colleagues with the right EQ, the right uh, context, then you're not going to gauge this workforce, right? So, um, I mean, this is what being a humanist in action is all about, right? Always put people at the heart of what you do and what you think. And to me, it's complex. And of course, there are 10 chapters. And if you do this consistently, you're more likely to get there if you don't. But there are two really basic questions that I ask myself every single day. I mean, today we had a full, uh, you know, set of meetings with my colleagues from China. And it says, you know, the what? In this meeting, are we doing the right thing? Are we asking the right questions? Is the strategy right? Do we have the right goals? Relatively easy. But then how do people feel in the meeting, right? How do people feel in the action? And if I get the answer to the what and not the how, I'm not happy. By the way, it's much easier to fix the what than the how. And, 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 and this, is, you know, this is what engagement is all about. Essentially, you know, people need to know that as a leader, you're there to help set the directions, you help to get the strategy presented to the shareholders, get the capital you need, et cetera, and so forth. But you're also there, you know, to make sure that everybody can contribute. And you're also there to show that you truly care in the good and the bad days. And at the end of the day, what matters is not you as a leader, but the future of, of the company. And I always get the questions, right? Well, if you're people-centric, how can you satisfy shareholders? Well, guess what? Shareholders and people want the same thing. Shareholders want sustainable performance. They want great results today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow. Employees, they want their workplace to be great today, the day after tomorrow, and forever, right? And if shareholders and employees don't share the common goals of making their workplace better for all stakeholders, they're going to get there. And, and, and I talk quite a bit about it in, in the book. Lots of CEOs are very short-term minded. And if as a leader, you're short-term minded and the only thing you care about is the share price of the company, then yeah, you can increase your share price. But you're not going to get a true sustainable performance no, you know, future for, for your company. So the meaning of what we do as leaders and explaining it, contextualizing it you know, in simple terms with total respect for everyone you know, helps you a lot and, and, and it's an invitation for people to, to work with you. So there are 10 uh, chapters or principles, as you said, they are all independent. My view is that applying these 10 consistently will help you to get, uh, you know, to the place we're talking about. But it's hard work. And, and by the way, it takes a long time. 
let me let me turn this the other way around, right? So if you look at a leader who is not people centric, how do I know that's the leader? That's that's the kind of leader who is not people centric. Oh, plenty of example. Selfish number one. Uh, me, myself, and I. Um, leaders who wrote books, who write books, but only talk about themselves. And there are plenty of these books out there, right? Um, um, I mean, when I... Uh, the art you know, of making it. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm the super god, right? And, and I've learned, you know, very early on that, you know, you don't, judge, you don't judge the characters of people in mainstream behaviors because are, these are learned. So for instance, when I interview a future leaders, I always have a meeting in the office, but also I take a meeting in a, in a bar or in a restaurant because I want to see how that person talks to the waitress or the waiters. But fundamentally, you know, uh, I, 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 I say the only thing I know is that I don't know everything. Fundamentally, if you don't have intrinsic respect for everyone around you, you cannot be a good leader, and, and and that's the opposite of being selfish. The other thing too is, uh, as a leader, you need to know that it's good to go into a meeting not having all the answers for the, for the team. It's good to know to be proven wrong. It's good to say I was wrong. It's good to be vulnerable. Um, I always, you know, say within our within our board at, at Intertech or when I was at Drake, it's the same. You know, we are all very successful. We are all very experienced. But you know what? Let's leave the experience, the egos, the title, the fame outside the room. Here, we are all among equal. What matters is the intellectual argument to take the company from A to B with the right values, respect, and, 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 the, and, and this is what, what it's all about, right? Selfish, you know, self-centered, egoistic people, yeah, will get success, but will not get, you know, the long-term, you know, upside that the company deserves. All right. Now let's go to the to the first uh, principle, right? Leading with emotional intelligence, right? And in the book, you 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 highlight five values, right? Respect, courage, passion, integrity, and responsibility. Actually, when I was reading the book, I was kind of uh, smiling to myself because uh, you know you you guys know this uh, program that I do with children. These are the five values that we also teach kids. Right, so 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 I was really kind of excited to see that you know I have some confirmation that uh, you know these are important values. But I, I want to want to hear from you. Why do you highlight these five values, right? And if I ask you to choose one, because I, I feel that it's difficult to kind of to try to practice all five, right? So if I have to start with one, which would you go for? Courage. Courage. Why? Because this is something that's not common in most corporations. Politics takes courage away. Uh, being uh, a risk taker is not something that people are necessarily comfortable with. And, and you know, when you are working in a company, you hear take the company with your colleagues from A to B. And a lot of companies don't truly perform because there is not enough courage inside the organization. Playing safe is the opposite of progress. And it's interesting because um, another, you know, professor, you know, uh, made the same comments about the values and, and he was very surprised to see courage because it's very rare that it's you know mentioned as one of the key value, and and I'm I'm a big fan of risk taking because no eggs no omelet right. It, it's funny coming from a CEO of a FTSE 100 company that uh, that 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 you're willing to take big risks because obviously you have a lot to answer to your shareholders, right? If you were to take too much risk. But the, the concept of risk is relative, right? Um, and and I, we are in the risk business at Intertech, and, and I'm going to basically give you a, a story about risk, which is going to resonate with you. Who is a fan of Formula One? 
Okay. My my favorite driver was Alton Senna. At the time where he was, you know, fighting with Prost. At the time I was with Pepsi and I was running Seven Up, and we had sponsored the Benetton uh, team, and I was the lucky uh, executive to go to most of the races. And I remember that race extremely well. In uh, in 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 Rio de Janeiro, the first race of the of the season, and Arten, you know, won. Um, and and I followed him and, and through, through the season. And many, many years later, when I was at the McLaren uh, factory in London, in north of London, I met his engineer. And I said, tell me about Arton, right? Because I, I, I met him, but I never knew him very well. He says, Andre, in the, in, in, the, in the business of Formula One, he was the most risk-aware driver. When we were preparing for the race, he was the one challenging the authorities to make sure the safety you know, uh, measures were in place. Because he was the most risk aware, he was the most risk prepared, and he could take more risk because he knew where he could accelerate. And, and I, use, uh, I, I use sport as, as, a, as, a, a, as a metaphor quite a bit. I mean, being a good leader, right, is knowing that you and your team are very, very, very you know, uh, competitive in your own market. But it's knowing that you have identified all the opportunities and the risk, and you have total confidence in your team to accelerate and take your competition over, right? So risk-taking, yes, it starts by being risk-prepared, and it starts, of course, by being risk-aware. And look, shareholders don't want uh, you know, CEOs to play a safe pair of hands, because if you play safe, you will ge generate you know, average res results. What they want is people who understand where the opportunity is, they got the clear plans, they got the risk identified. They're open about the risk, by the way. You know, there is no point in saying, you know what, there is no risk because it's not true. I mean, just uh, look what happened this weekend. Another bank that uh, collapsed, you know, uh, I mean, it's just uh, amazing, right? This is life, right? So it's about being risk aware, risk prepared, but no eggs, no omelets. I mean, if you want to go into business and, and have a serious impact, if you play safe, yeah, you're going to have a safe life, but not exciting. In a, in a developing country, in an emerging market like China, I, I suppose integrity is important, right? Uh, given that uh, in many emerging markets, the, you know, the rule of law may have uh, a lot of gray areas and so on, right? So what, what, what would you say about these values in a place like China? Yeah. Which would you go for? So look, I will be very uh, transparent here. I totally disagree with the view that integrity is an issue in certain parts of the world. I really believe in diversity. We all have our strengths and, and weaknesses. And we are in, in the business of risk management at Intertech. I mean, I can tell you more example about integrity issues in the Western world than in the emerging markets, right? This concept that integrity is only an issue in certain countries and not others is a farce. I mean, I worked for some of the best corporations in the world, Aston Young, Colgate, Pepsi, the Walt Disney Corporations, Burger King, Diageo, Inchcape. I was... Uh, very close to Toyota, Volkswagen, Audi, BMW, Mercedes. And now with Intertech, we work with more than 400,000 customers. I work with Rekit Benkiza. I can tell you that all the integrity stories, I can tell you there is no bias in terms of country of origin. It's all in the character of the people who are basically driving uh, you know, these companies. I started my career as an auditor in Africa. I did an audit of you know the risks in the number one bank in Niger, Niamey. What happened this weekend is exactly what happened there, and what happened you know when the banking system collapsed. Integrity is or lack of integrity is an issue of character, is an issue of greed, is an issue of priorities. And and doesn't matter where you come from, you will get caught. But integrity, there is no negotiation, right? As I talk about uh, that in the in, in the book. If you have an issue of integrity in your team, 
you have to act. And by the way, you know, I really feel strong about that, as you noticed. It's not a function of origin, it's a function of character. You've got to be true to your own self. That's... Yeah, exactly right, exactly right. If you're not integra, when you look at yourself in the mirror, what do you see? A farce. If you're integra and you're honest with yourself, you know what? You see yourself and, and nobody is perfect, right? Uh, let me give you another example about, uh, not integrity, but close to the concept of zero defect manufacturing, right? So when you talk to, to, to a lot of companies, people believe that zero defect manufacturing has to be everywhere. And I said, no. I work for some of the best companies in the world. There is no plant which is zero defect. Not even Toyota, one of the best car uh, manufacturing company in the world, there is also some areas that need to be improved. And that's okay because it's a pursuit of perfection, right? But you do that with integrity, recognizing that there are mistakes that you need to fix and you're open and the speed at which you move is going to help you, you know, to get there faster. And, and unless you have this integrity about being open about your own weakness and doing something about it, you're never going to make progress, right? Okay, all right. Now let's move to the, uh, the 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 second one, right? Which is about this um, uh, uh, sharing the vision together with uh, you know with 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 the employees, with the workers. And you use this term uh, size of the price. I, I like that. Uh, could you tell us more about this size of the price? But also, as I was reading that particular part, I, I was wondering. Shouldn't the leader also tell the people how this price would be shared, right? Because if at the end of the day, if the price is basically going to a few individuals, right? And, and when we, we, we hear this quite a bit, for example, in the finance industry, right? Where, where you have these people who make mistakes are actually being rewarded, right? Uh, whereas so the people who actually do the work may not get any part of the price, right? So shouldn't the leader also be, 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 be generous, be fair uh, in ensuring that the price that you're talking about is going to be shared equitably? I mean, absolutely. I mean, the, the governance that needs to be in place to make sure that the fruits of the growth are properly shared is absolutely paramount. How you get there is more complicated than you know, people think, but this is very, very, very important, right? Uh, but the size, the size of the price is essentially where do you see the opportunity for your business uh, in terms of growth and, and, and how you're going to seize that ahead of your uh, competitors and making sure that you translate that in a vision that is meaningful for everyone, right? And, and that's the key, right? To find a vision that people are going to relate to. And it's very difficult, very difficult. I mean, I developed with my teams many, many strategies for all the businesses I've worked in. And I didn't crack it all the time. As a matter of fact, we are presenting uh, in two weeks from now um, our future strategy at Intertech, right? And I was sharing with my colleagues, I was not happy with, with, with the name of the strategy till a few days ago because it was not meaningful and, and engaging enough, right? But give you a, an example that worked really, really well for me. It was Burger King, Germany. Uh, when I arrived there in, in 1996, it was just after the mad cow disease. The business was losing money and we had to reinvent, turn around the business. And we had 120 restaurants, 60 company run restaurants, 60 franchises. And when you work with franchises, they all put their own money and their future in your hands. So it's a big responsibility, right? And obviously the system was on its knees. People were complaining, you know, criticizing each other. So we had to find a vision that was, you know, all encompassing and, and, and really meaningful for everyone, right? Our shareholders, but also the restaurant managers and their team. And we prepared the strategy and, and, and it was all about, you know, finding the right format to make the restaurants more profitable. And at the time, it was when East Germany reopened, uh, open, sorry, and a lot of companies put investment in East Germany, but the market was underdeveloped. They lost a lot of money. And, and we found out that the best profitable restaurants were the drive-through in West Germany. And, 
And, and I was on, on, on the plane with my marketing director. We were working on the strategy. And I said, hey, Pascal, have you noticed, right, that the restaurants that, that, that basically, you know, do, uh, you know, best in terms of, you know, profit profitability are the restaurants that do about 3.5 million Deutschmarks a year. And I said, it's interesting because 3.5 million Deutschmarks a year is 10,000 Deutschmarks a day. And, and, and we launched a strategy called Vision 10,000. When we start, we were at 5,786. When we finished, we were at 10,500. But Vision 10,000 with the right priorities and, and the right enablers and the right investments, everybody understood it. If you were in a restaurant in Berlin or, 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 or Munich, uh, you could relate to it, right? And it helped us crystallize, you know, for everyone in the system, what success could look like, right? So you have, you have to spend time and, and, and dissect the essence of the strategy and, and make sure that it's energizing, it's, it's clear, it's bold, it's engaging, right? As far as you know, sharing the fruits of the success, as a CEO, you need to make sure that you recruit, you develop, you retain, and you reward you know, properly. And unless you have that, you're going to have issues because at the end of the day, you know, what is the number one leading indicator in a well-run company is turnover rate, voluntary, you know, turnover, right? And, and, and I always say that to, 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 to my people, I says, the reason why we need to be the best, the reason why we need to grow faster than the competition, it's not because we're going to make much more money, it's because the best people want to work for the best. And if you have a low, you know, voluntary turnover rate, it's a demonstration that you are a highly engaged organization, right? because people see they can grow with the company, et cetera, and so forth. So absolutely, absolutely. If as a CEO, you don't, um, you know, reward every single stakeholder based on what the stakeholders really expect from you, you're not going to get there. That's the chapter number 10 about sustainability, right? You need to reward your customers, your suppliers, your shareholders, your employees, the communities, the regulator, that's what it, and all, unless every single stakeholder gets something, you're not going to be able to drive what I call is real sustainability, which is sustainable growth and value for every single stakeholders. And sometimes it can be diverging interests, but you've got to find a way that it's converging. Otherwise, you don't get there. And in today's world, in today's world, where any stakeholder can go online and undermine the reputation of your company. If you don't have all stakeholders in mind, if you only focus on your share price, you're not going to be successful. I mean, look at you know the way uh, the new owner of uh, of Twitter, you know, talked about the workforce. Mm. But, but do you prioritize your stakeholders in any way? What you need to do is really being very clear as, as a as an executive team, what's your purpose, right? What's the essence of, you know, of your role in society, right? Where is your market, your size of price? What is your, uh, what, what is the direction of travel, right? What's your vision? What are your priorities? What are your are you enablers? And where are your goals? And, and how do you make sure that your goals address your stakeholders' uh, interests? And if you're not able to address all of them, you're going to fail. You're going to fail. It's hard, but you have to take them all into consideration. By the way, I mean, we, we are uh, going into a new world where you know, companies uh, have to report on their sustainability. I mean, this is what it's all about, right? If you look at you know, uh, corporate sustainability, it's essentially how you're performing on your non-financial indicators. But even in the sustainability, you, know, you talk about governance, you talk about you know, uh, shareholder satisfaction, et cetera, and so forth, right? You have to. It's hard work, but that's what leadership is all about. It is difficult. I mean, you know, how, how, how do you balance? Because nowadays, uh, you know, the stakeholders are people who may not have any direct relationship to your company. That's right. Right? It could be NGOs. Yeah, that's right. right? It could be, you know, activists of some sort. Right? And these are still part of your stakeholders yeah. today, not just your customers, your employees, yeah. right? And, and you, you, you've got to be honest. I mean, you, you might have a strategy and goals that is going to help you um, 
direct your energy to satisfy the interests of every single stakeholder. But it's, like, it's a pursuit of perfection. You might not always get there, but be honest. This is what you're trying to do. I mean, I give you an example. I was meeting customers for, for Intertech you know, last week. We are in a quality assurance business, right? Mm. And uh, she was complaining about an issue of quality in one of our labs. And, and the, the sales teams were surprised the way answers because they said, well, you, should have, you could have said we are the best. No, I say, we believe we are pretty good. We believe we work hard. We believe we are you know, better than the competitors, but we're not perfect. And if there is a mistake, we're going to deal with it. Um, now, she was very happy with that because I was honest. And, and this is what, I mean, business is not a science, right? Um, and and, and, and you've got, you got to be engaging with every single stakeholder. I mean, even if you have a, a, a set of shareholders who are very, very happy, you might have one or two who are not happy. Well, you need to listen, to engage, and explain what, 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 what you're doing. And at the end of the day, the shareholders will vote with her or his credit card and say, you know, I invest in this company or not. I mean, it's a free, it's a free market, right? Um, but you got you to try. And if you're clear about the levers and, and your, your discipline on how you pursue these, you're honest and you communicate in good and bad times, by the way, right? Because communication in good times is easy, but in bad times it's more difficult, right? You're more likely to engage your, your, your stakeholders because at the end of the day, people know that you know, business is not a science, right? Mm. Okay, so so that basically is the tenth uh, uh, principle on on uh, uh, sustainable performance for all, right? This this idea of how do you that that you have to deal with all your stakeholders, right? Uh, uh, simultaneously, right? In a sense, uh, 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 Andre, I, I want to go to number nine, right? Uh, uh, this 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 branding globally that you call it. Um, I mean, it's interesting because when you look at China today, uh, of course, in the 1990s, as long as it's a foreign brand, it sells in China, right? But today, this is not the same story anymore, right? You could be a foreign brand, but there is no guarantee because you have, you know, Chinese brands that are uh, probably as good or maybe even better, like CIBS, uh, you know, and 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 so. How do you, you know, how do you balance this? I always wonder that, you know, is, is the China market, when we talk about, say, decoupling, right? Is the China market also decoupling from the world in this perspective, in the sense that, you know, that, that it, is, it is, you know, it's a separate market. It's a different market, right? So if the branding is, uh, if the branding strategy is being decided in, you know, in London, Paris, or New York, how is this going to be accepted in a place like China, for instance? That's a great question. China is no exception. It's very tough to be a global brand, no matter where you are in the world. I mean, I grew up with very, very big global brands. And I remember these discussions, right? You were Pepsi, you were you know, Colgate. And, and, and the world has changed. You know, when I was you know, at the early days of my careers, Big ideas would come from Paris, New York, London, but now ideas come from anywhere. People are smart because they've got the data, they've got the education. It's much easier to find you know, a bank to help you today than ever before. You want to launch a brand, you can go e-commerce. You don't need to convince Walmart and Carrefour to get on the shelves. If you've got a big ideas and you find the right suppliers and you've got the right formulations, and you go online and you can try your luck, right? And, 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 it, and this is good news. Why? Because as society, you know, improves its lifestyle, markets get more mature. When markets mature, you get a natural fragmentation of needs. People want to be special. They want to feel special. They want customized product, right? So the level of customization in the world today is just immense. And that's why it's super tough to be, to be a global brand. Now, I'm not saying that global brands don't work because they do, but, but look at India. Global brands penetrate a very, very short you know, uh, space in the market. And maybe they will never find a way to penetrate the, all, all the segments in India, right? If you look at, you know, uh, you know I was in San Francisco the, the, the other day doing a, a few, a, a few uh, meetings with shareholders and, and our, our teams. And I had not been in San Francisco for a long time. 
I mean, the number of brands on the high streets that I had never seen before, I was amazed. I mean, I was in the burger business, so I knew every single burger brand in the world. I mean, there are many brands that were totally new. And, and, and that's what the opportunity is today. If someone has got a good insight and could come up with a formulation, a concept, a service that targets a certain space of the market, you can make a lot of money and, and, and be very successful for all your stakeholders, right? Now, scaling it up is another story, but this is the world today. So in terms of communication, which is what the chapter, you know, number 10 is all about, I believe in global branding. I think as a marketer or advertising agency or communicator, whatever you want to name yourself, you need to recognize there are some global trends. We are a global village, but there are some very important local nuances where people want to have a customized lifestyle. They want to be part of a global village, but they want, you know, the special pub in their village to be theirs because that, that, that gives them a lot of energy. And as, as, a, as companies, you need to recognize it. And it's super tough for global companies. That's super tough for global companies because a lot of them don't know how to do that. Where it's super tough is social media. I mean, when I was at, uh, at, at Ben Kieser, we were the first, we were the first to put here in Shanghai, the team of, in the first global company to put here in Shanghai, a team of 25 social media marketeers 24 seven to build the Durex brand in this market. Because once you're in social media, you're 24 seven and you gotta be local as well as global, right? That's why very few companies are good at social media. It's super tough. But that's the world today, going back to stakeholders, right? I'm based in Shanghai. I will say what I think about brand A, B, and C. And you better be good because I've got a choice, not only to buy uh, your product and services, but I've got the choice to be positive or negative about you. Are, are you going to deal with China differently post-COVID in your company? There are two markets for us in China, right? We are in the export market and we are in the domestic market. It's about 75, 25%. We are the first international testing company to come in Shanghai many, many years ago. So we are very strong in the export market. And we knew pre-COVID that the domestic market was gonna be a huge growth area and that has not changed, mm. right? What has changed, is the set of narratives driven by the geopolitics that we are seeing every single day that basically kind of saying to a lot of companies, are you sure you want to invest in China? And my view is the people who ask themselves these questions, of course, have got the right to ask themselves these questions, but what they do not understand is the fact that when it comes to manufacturing excellence, there are three markets in the world that are best in class, Japan, Germany, and China. And what companies get in China, they don't get it anywhere else. So what I think we're gonna need to do at Intertech differently post COVID is to make sure that people truly understand what the manufacturing excellence of China is all about. And I'm not going to go into, into politics tonight because that's not my, my job as step of politics, but we have to explain to our clients, you know what, when it comes to that kind of product category, that kind of technology, there are very few markets that are as good as China. So make sure you think about it twice before you say, you know what, I'm not going to invest in China because you might regret it. Because if your competitors does it, you will lose. And, and, and that's the interesting dynamic at the moment. But I can tell you that the people who know the supply chains that you know, we operate in around the world know that. I mean, the same person I was talking to last week in Germany, I was asking her, I says, okay, what are you doing? Uh, are you pursuing a China plus one strategy? And she said, of course, you know, I had to invest in, in Bangladesh to produce you know, T-shirts that are lower cost. But the customer service I get in China, I don't get it anywhere. That's the strength of China. Customer service. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, I think uh, uh, maybe we can open this up to the floor.
uh, uh, for any uh, questions that you may have uh, about the book. Oh, yeah. uh, and also, I think uh, other, other, you know, uh, I mean, since we are talking about, uh, uh, you know, a leader, a CEO of, a, of a, you know, a very established, long established company, uh, I think uh, we have to take advantage as much as possible to, to, to you know, uh, pick on uh, Andre's brains as much as possible, right? And also just a little add-on, um, good question. If you ask a good question, you'll get a copy of Andre's book. <laughs> <laughs> Who decides whether it's a good question? Uh, professor, you can decide. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, guys, any questions? Please. If you add one more leadership person, Paul, what will it be? <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask questions. <laughs> what, what, what's the question? I mean, if you uh, want to add another principle, what would it be? Yeah, look. Um, I'm not going to be dogmatic, but I'm very comfortable with the 10 principles. And uh, I, I, I thought about these long, 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 long time ago, and I've been practicing these. And, um, you know, what's interesting about the, the principles and, and they are industry agnostic. Uh, they are also position agnostic, right? You could be running a restaurant, a hotel, a small company, large companies, global company, a university, you could be the head of China and still these apply. They are truly agnostic. And 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 in in, in the um in the in the preface, right, when I talk about why the world needs good leadership, is because I'm of the view that all the major crises that we have lived through since the beginning of the 21st century are due to a lack of leadership in some part of society. Now I'm in 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 the private sector, so I'm not you know running for president. But we in the in 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 the in the private sector, when we are leaders, we have a duty is to try to make the workplace a bit better. And the grand meaning, if you want, of of, of the book is that if we all in a workplace make our workplace a bit better, then the world is going to be slightly better. Because I'm of the view that it's very difficult for the existing institutions in the world to find the solutions to this very complex planet that is ours. So I'm pretty comfortable with the 10. There's no discount that, you know, you take 10, you get one free. It doesn't work that way. Andres. Uh, thank you. Andres, I have one question uh, for the chapter two. Uh, it's interesting wording. Paint a picture for all. Um, can I take that literally, that if I go to your company, that I can really see it and your employees can see it every day or is it hidden in some some drawer you know well um if you um would go through uh all parts of the company you will you will sense a clear direction of travel for for everyone uh it might not be everywhere on the wall but there will be quite a, a, a significant alignment is everybody on the same page? Of course not. Uh, we have to be realistic. Uh, but is it clear, well communicated? Uh, I think so. Uh, do we need to repeat it? You bet. I mean, we have to repeat it all the time. Um, Does it have to be tangible? I mean, like, like for example, this burger thing that you mentioned, yeah. right? Yes, ten thousand for each. Uh, you know, no, not not necessarily. I mean, that worked for for us at the time. It was a franchise system, so people had pressure from their banks, and money was important, therefore revenue. But if you look at you know uh, at Intertech, right? Our purpose is really you know to make the world ever better, right? We are the the you know the, the risk based quality assurance specialists, and we do that to help our clients obviously have the right safety, quality, and sustainability standards in their products and services, but ultimately is to make the world a bit better, right? Much, much safer. And, 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 and I can tell you that that direction of travel, everybody, everybody understands. Okay. Oh, I have a question to point three. Uh, you've been working uh, with a very traditional organization and you've met many employees. They've been working for 15, 20 years in the organization, on the same level. How do you energize these guys? 
And this is what I'm fighting with. Good question. So you, you're working in which industry? Automotive. Okay. And you find it difficult to energize. Uh, how do you... Well, well oh, thank you. <laughs> Good question. He hasn't even finished the question yet, Carolina. No, I mean, I mean, I'm working with, uh, let's call it in, in, in automotive, even very traditional automotive supplier company, obviously European one. And there are people on the same level. We, we agree on that not all of us can go to the top. And I'm feeling that the energy is not there. Mm. And fighting, again, fighting how to find a, a way how to energize an employee in her, in his age, my age. Mm. Uh, yeah, he doesn't want to be general manager or she doesn't want to be general manager. Uh, but she, he likes to work eight hours a day, and that's it. Yeah, so, so I mean, that, that's uh, at the heart of engagement, right? Now, in, and, and this is what <laughs> the 10 principles are, and now you've got the book, so uh, hopefully... <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Just, 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 no, 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 I'm, I'm coming to that. No, I, I, I want, to, I want to be, to be helpful. In every organization, you're going to have three type of behaviors, right? You're going to have the promoters, the people who are super excited. You're going to have the passive and the detractors. And when you drive engagement, your first priority is, is to make sure that you convert as many passive, you know, employees to, to promoters, right? And it's all about, you know, explaining why we are here and, and how they can make a difference and how, you know, they are part of a team and, 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 and what's in it for them and where do they get their energy. It's talking to, to them and understanding, you know, where, where the hot buttons are and where are their frustrations. You know, um, one of the things that I ask a lot, you know, where do you get your energy from, but where do you lose your energy, right? And, and creating a team that's got a sense of belonging as a team, if you've got your own team. And when you are in an organization that has a low level of engagement, it's very frustrating for a leader like you because you feel powerless. But start with your own team and, and try to make a difference there. And then step by step, you will inspire others. Uh, it's much more fun as a leader to work in an engaged working environment than in a disengaged working environment because you know, you're part of something very special. And, and I can tell you, there is nothing more exhilarating is to achieve great things through people. And unless you've got an engaged workforce, you'd never get there. So I'm sure you will find a way with your own team. And, and then because you will be very successful, maybe you will get a bigger team and maybe you run the entire place one day. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I was... I was reading an article written on LinkedIn by you, uh, and it says that um, intellect are uh, committed to reduce its carbon dioxide emission um, by 80% um, before 2050. And I was wondering, um, would it be possible to share like your experience in um, how did you um, paint the picture of sustainability for um, all of inter intertech because um, I am aware that there are uh, a number of subsidiaries seated all over the world um, with um, the headquarter in London. And I actually have a second question, if you don't mind. Um, um, I'm aware that um, Intertech uh, has over 20 patents from 2018 all the way to 2022. Um, and this is like a very impressive resume judging by any international company. So I was wondering, um, what is your experience in driving your organization to outperform in uh, intellectual property and innovation? Thank you very much. Okay, uh, maybe she gets, she two, gets books, two books, two books. Uh, <laughs> uh, so look, um, the race to net zero, which is you know meeting the Paris Agreement and targets is, is a real one. Um, I'm very concerned personally where the world is because there is not a lot of transparency as we were talking earlier today, you know, politicians are not honest with, with everyone. And it is my view that, um, you know, we will not get to net zero unless, 
you know, we come up with some very, very innovative, you know, technology like, you know, carbon capture, for instance, and get into synthetic fuels. We are at Intertech, you know, uh, helping our clients to get the highest quality safety and sustainability features in everything they do. So sustainability is really at the heart of what we stand for in society, in addition to quality and safety. And it is really central to, to our purpose. It's central to our values, central to our strategies, and, and, and central certainly to all the work that we do with all stakeholders. Um, when it comes to net zero, we are committed to be net zero by 2050. We've reduced our CO2 emissions by 8% in 2022. We still have a lot of work to do. And what we have done you know, to commit to net zero and engage the organization, we first started to collect the data before setting a goal. Because a lot of mistakes that company make is they say, we're gonna go to net zero, not understanding what net zero is all about. And we started building the database to a point that now we have in every single operations, you know, real data on monthly basis about scope one, scope two, and direct scope three. I don't know if you guys are specialists in sustainability or if you know about science-based target. I spend a lot of time, you know, uh, with a lot of governments on, on, on net and our clients committing to indirect, indirect scope three uh, net zero target is a big mistake. Because if everybody does that, there will be double, triple counting and we, it's gonna be confusing. So we focus on direct scope one, two, and so, so scope one, two, and direct scope three. And we have got plans. And, 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 and because we have engaged our colleagues, we communicate, we measure, and then we are talking about reward. We are potentially one of the few companies in the world where everybody has got 15% of the annual bonus linked to the target achievement on net zero. So we take that very, very seriously. Why? Because it's important. It's true to our purpose. And certainly we want to lead by examples. We are one of the few company that does that in a systematic way like this, right? I run CO2 emission in terms of metrics, like I run revenue. So we have monthly uh, reviews with our team to know where we are in terms of CO2 for that month. As far as outperforming uh, your competitors in terms of IP and patents and innovation, look, um, we are a pioneer at Intertech, right? We, we, we are not the biggest, but in our culture, we are very customer centric. Uh, we are very science-based. We've got tremendous, tremendous colleagues. And there is one thing we like best when we have a client coming to us is to find an idea that doesn't exist for the client. So innovation is really in our gene. And what we've done, we've made it you know, uh, clear to every business that they've got the license to innovate at the local level. As a matter of fact, you know, John today was presenting a big idea that is going to come you know, from, from here. Uh, that's going to potentially conquer the world. But, you know, it's going to start here in, 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 in Shanghai. So everybody at Indotech has got the license to innovate. We call that a zero to one, right? Innovation at the local level. And then we take them to 100 countries. If you don't reinvent yourself, I mean, I, I talk quite about it, somebody will do it for you. So you better stay focused on innovation. Otherwise, you'll get out of business over time. Okay. Yes. Thank you. You mentioned about customer focus. Actually, I was looking at the number four of customer intimacy, and I was wondering, uh, you chose the word intimacy rather than focused or centric. Um, do you see different difference between intimacy and how intimate it is? <laughs> uh, yeah, we, it's a good, good, good play on words. I mean, you need to know your, your customer intimately well, right? That, that's what, it, what it's all about. And, 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 and you want to be, you know, the one that reads the positive, negative, you know, feedbacks of your clients first. Uh, you want to, to get these insights ahead of your competition so that you are the first to bring, to bring the solution, right? And, and, and a lot of, you know, companies say they are customer centric, but they're not. Mm. Uh, so it's about how you measure customer satisfaction. So for instance, we at Intertech use NPS, Net Promoter Score, that I'm sure you heard about it. We do close to 6,000 interviews a month so we are potentially one of the companies in the world doing the highest numbers of customer uh, you know, surveys. We do that because every single team get the 20 or 30 interviews in their uh, market space immediately so they can do something about it, right? One of the things that's really important in, in customer uh, centricity is 
complaining management. A lot of companies don't listen to their customers when they complain about something. I give a few examples in the book about airline industry. Uh, but I learned it, you know, um, when I was at Disney, I was amazed about the rigor at which Disney was treating every single complaint. Why? When the customer takes the time to complain, you got to show respect. That person has invested time to tell you there is something wrong with your business. So take the time to look at what's, uh, you know, the issue here, because it's very likely to be a breakdown in your processes or, or, or control. Um, and of course, spending time with, with, with clients. I mean, the, 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 the mistake that most companies do is they become internally focused and, 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 and not being you know, in the stream of what's happening within your uh, client's world is, 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 is a mistake, right? So it's super important, but you go to, net, to know your customers intimately well. This is what it's all about, right? Okay. Yeah. Just to relay on customer, uh, I guess Intertech is uh, subcontracting or having a lot of suppliers. So how do you ensure that your leadership that you have inside your company can spread to them? So it's a, it's a good question. So what we do is we do independent testing certification assurance um, in, you know, in lots of industries. So in terms of external suppliers, we don't have too many suppliers. Because our people is really where the Intertech IP is. We recruit PhDs, scientists, engineers, chemists, and, and the science-based knowledge that, that we have combined with our you know, processes and, and technology, and, and, and of course, our, our solutions, is how we deliver you know, independent quality assurance to our clients. If, of course, we, we work with suppliers, we expect our suppliers to follow certain aspects of our, you know, what we call doing business the right way, which is what we call sustainability in, 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 in the book, right? But that's, of course, what we do. If you don't basically have your suppliers, you know, follow your operating principles, you're going to have a problem, right? Hmm? I mean, that, that, that's, that's what we do for our clients, right? We, we basically do an audit of factories. We do an audit of, you know, the, the companies producing the raw materials. That's where you need independent assurance, right? Of course. Very important. Okay. Dave? My question sort of uh, uh, relates to everything everyone's been asking because you said something about... Uh, ensuring that all your stakeholders' uh, concerns and interests are taken into account, whether it's suppliers, customers, uh, your employees, stake, your shareholders. How do you, and I'm sure there are situations where you need to prioritize uh, certain stakeholders over the others. So just two things is how, do you have like a system beyond, uh, behind how you prioritize depending on the situation? And more importantly, how do you enable your team to, think in that manner because they are the ones who are going to be uh, doing the execution, the planning and the execution. So what very few, you know, companies do is, is basically do a strategic plan with their stakeholders in mind, right? So that, you know, you know exactly these are the expectations of your clients. This is what fair trade means with your suppliers. This is certainly what being the employer of choice for your employees is all about. This is how you should you know, behave in, in terms of good neighborhood in your communities. This is how you should basically work with the regulator. This is how you basically uh, you know, communicate and engage with your, with your shareholders. And when you are the CEO of a company, you are in a swim of all these streams and all these streams converge to you. And if you're not able to make sense of the various stakeholders, when you develop a strategy, you're gonna have a problem. Now, does it mean that you address every single at the same time? Of course not, right? The day has got you know, so many hours and you've got to, to prioritize. But in terms of goals and priority setting and, and treating every stakeholders with the same respect and, and weight, you, you've, got to be, you've got to be whiter than white. Otherwise, you're not being true to what being a sustainable company is all about, right? But it, it's, you see, the, 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 it's not as complicated as people would think because it's common sense, right? 
and and uh, I mean to, just to give you uh, to, to to give you an example, right? Um, in in our industry, we are the, the high quality operator, right? I believe that we are the best in terms of quality and customer service. We're not perfect, and certainly that's what the data shows, right? To accelerate growth, it would be easy for us to do so by lowering the prices. And the reason why, you know, we don't want to do it and I don't want to do it, number one, because it undermines your ability to uh, deliver a sustainable margin for your shareholders, right? Because you lower your price, you become a commodity. But when it comes to your number one, um, number one stakeholders called customers, if you are in a quality assurance business and you lower the prices, one day you will have to lower your costs. It will not be able to do a good job in terms of customer service. That's why I'm against discounting. Because at the end of the day, it might increase you know, uh, revenue in the short term, but the long term is bad for your shareholders, but longer term is really bad for your customers. Here's a good, is a good example. And then the moment you start doing that, you set the examples around the companies and then everybody does that, and then it's the beginning of the end, right? That's the commodity trap. There are books, you know, written about that. When you are a premium operator, you got to stay premium price because unless you do so, you're going to compromise the interests of many stakeholders. Here's a simple example, right? Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for uh, tonight, Sherry. Um, as you said. Uh, a uh, people-centric or people, uh, customer-centric organization can acceler accelerate the business growth. And it's not easy job, it's very hard. It requires a leadership with soul. Um, so when I think about soul, uh, it really linked to the personality. So uh, my question is, was there any certain um, leaders, leaders' personalities you found is quite, uh, important or played a key role in the leadership we saw? And also, uh, is there any personality pattern you found in your team, which uh, can be potentially trained uh, to be leadership we saw? So, I mean, there are many uh, important attributes, you know, to be a good leader, right? Which is which is your 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 question? Because leadership with soul is about defining what good leadership is, recognizing that the soul of an organization is important as you know the the visible part of the culture. And to do that, you got to be put people at the heart of your of of, of everything you do. Uh, I mean, to me, you know, being a good leader, first of all, you've got to be very curious. That's why your question was very good. Right? If you're not curious as a as a leader. Uh, you're never going to max out because you got to be searching for always a new answer to existing or, or future problems. Like curiosity is very, very, very important. It's also being, 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 being open with, you know, with, with the entire, with the entire world. Another, you know, very, very, very important attribute uh, of a good leader is being confident in, in, in yourself, but never go to the, other side of confidence, which is arrogance, and, and always, always believe that there is a better way in doing it, right? And, 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 and always, you know, learn on the way, right? Uh, in, in the moment you stop learning as a leader, you know, you, you stop progressing and, and, and the company will, 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 not, will not progress, right? I mean, there is another very uh, important uh, <laughs> characteristic uh, when you, um, when, when if you want to be a good leader, is what I call composure under pressure. Um, stakeholders management uh, means a lot of people to answer to throughout your questions, right? And there will be good and bad times. And and if you're not composed, and you if if you're emotional or if you're hysterical or you overreact, you will scare people, and people will will not respect you. And especially in in, in tough times, right? Not losing your composure. Is is very 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 important, and then you know one you know final you know characteristics that that I really believe is 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 critical when you lead an organization is you know don't hire people that are exactly like you. You've got to believe in diversity, right? Um, I mean, I wrote a story yesterday on LinkedIn on that, right? The world is a mosaic, right? 
of, of talents, right? And then you got to believe in, in building a team that is truly diverse. Uh, because if you hire people exactly like you, uh, you know, it's not going to be a very tasting meal. Uh, one last question, final question. Uh, please. Uh, thank you very much. My question is, do you believe that the style of the leadership should be localized by each area or each country? Because I'm managing Japanese cosmetic company. And when I was in Japan, uh, the style of the leadership, my leadership was like, I always try to avoid the conflict or the friction in the team because Japanese people don't like it. But after I came to China, one day my consultant said, Jun, your leader, the style of the leadership doesn't work in China. You have to change yourself. So that's my question. Like, do you, like, how do you, do, do we need to localize oh, the style of the leadership? I mean, at, at the heart of, you know, good leadership is emotional intelligence. Right, um, and and I know that your new dean is the dean of SAP where I studied, Frank. And and uh, I'll tell you the story. When when I graduated there a long time ago in 1983, um, there was no book on emotional intelligence. Uh, the concept didn't ex exist. And and we graduated in 1983. And 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 I remember you know going out of uh, you know. Uh, the last court on Friday, we're going to go and play tennis with, with, with a friend of mine. And I was with him in the in metro station and said, Pierre, you know, something that's interesting here, you know, we've all joined this business school because we are the best intellectually, right? We've been through the most demanding prep schools. We are the best in mathematics, physics, et cetera, and so forth. But when I see the behaviors of all of our colleagues here, I'm not sure they're all going to be very successful in, in their career because they're a bit arrogant, right? And, and emotional intelligence is the antinomy, the opposite of arrogance, right? It's putting yourself in the world that is your ecosystem and making sure that you flex your approach to basically uh, connect. And of course, you need to be flexible as a leader. I mean, today I run a global company and, and I have you know, to be today working with my colleagues in China. Yesterday, the day before I was in, in, in Germany and last week I was in France. And, and there are some cultural nuances. There are some etiquettes that, that, that you need to, you know, to, to respect and spend a lot of time in Japan when I was with, with Toyota. And I learned you know, at Toyota then a meeting in 15 minutes, you can achieve a lot, provide that you're disciplined and, and you're respectful, right? Of course, I mean, being uh, flexible and, and, and adapt yourself is, is what emotional intelligence is, is all about. If you don't have that, you, 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 you will not connect because at the end of the day, leadership is about you know, taking a company from A to B with your teams in a certain ecosystems you can have a vision, you can have a strategy, you can have the capital structure, you can have the financial means. But if, as a leader, you don't connect uh, with everyone and you don't share the same dream and you don't talk about their dream maybe differently when you're in Japan than Germany than, than, than Brazil, you're not connecting. So, of course, of course. But it doesn't mean that you have a different personality, right? It means that you understand what it is to, you know, work uh, with emotional intelligence.